capitalism had somehow not delivered the goods, not delivered on its own promises. And he posed himself the question, why not? And again, make a long story short, his answer was that inside capitalism are the reasons, the, the blockages, you might say, for why it couldn't deliver on the promises that it made. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Richard D. Wolf. He's a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and a visiting professor at the New School in New York. He's the number one best-selling author of Democracy at Work, a Cure for Capitalism. And the Capitalism's Crisis Deepens, uh, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown, and the new book, understanding Marxism. <laughs> and uh, Richard, I, I, as I told you before we started, uh, I would mostly really pick a fight with a guy like you, but I, I watched a few of your videos and I, I found myself strangely agreeing. I've told my listeners before that uh, Karl Marx is the most influential economist in world history. Uh, I don't think it turned out very well, uh, the application of his principles, but you know, what do you think? I mean, you wrote a book about understanding Marx. What, what, was his stuff just applied wrong? And that's why there was, uh, there, there was so much travesty uh, or was it misunderstood? I mean, what, what happened? No, I think it, it, you know, he is one of those people that come along historically for reasons we never quite understand. I'm sure it had something to do with his mother and his father and the community and uh, all the rest. Um, who's just, ahead of his time. I mean, he sees things, he pulls together different strands of understanding and comes up with insights that we co keep going back to. You know, he was deeply respectful, as, um, Marx was, of Adam Smith, for example. Mm -hmm. Wrote yeah. long, wrote great detailed analyses of Adam Smith's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say Adam Smith's another one. Uh, another one of these people that comes along and for whatever complicated reason, they get it. They see things uh, that other people don't see or don't see for a long time. And then periodically others get a glimpse and realize that he saw it already back then. And it's not that it doesn't change. It's not that we can't do better than Marx. We can. We should. And he would have been the first one to agree. Um, but it's an enduring level of insight. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way I would explain it to people is that there's no great mystery here. If you think of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, they're usually the people considered the, the founders of modern economics. They had something in common. They thought capitalism was spectacular. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They welcomed it. They thought it was an immense progress over feudalism. And so they were, call them this way, they were analysts who also celebrated. Mm -hmm. What Marx was, coming after them, what Marx was was a person who said, I agree that capitalism could have and should have brought the wonderful things that Smith and Ricardo thought they would. They thought capitalism would bring in the slogans of the French and American Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy. Marx loved all of that. But he felt coming, you know, 50 years later after them, that capitalism had come, but it hadn't brought the, the gifts. It didn't bring the liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. And his life's work was to show how and why capitalism prevents the achievement of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. So again, long story short, what you have in Marx is the critic of the system. Mm -hmm. What you have in Smith and Ricardo are the lovers, the celebrants right, sure. of this system. And you know, a balanced education in mm -hmm. economics should mm -hmm. include both. Yeah, fair it's enough, like, of course. Yeah, like yeah. If, you want to, if you want to study, I don't know, French literature, mm -hmm. read people who think it's the greatest thing, you know, ever, and read people who are critical of it, and then make your own conclusion. Yeah, 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 of course. Of the, course. Only, the only thing that motivates Americans like me to, get, to have a little bit of an edge when we talk is that we were denied that. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at me, look at me, I'll speak very personally. Uh, I, I'm a product of America's elite education. I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. 
Then I went to Stanford to get my master's degree, and I finished up with a PhD from Yale. It's like mm-hmm. a joke, right? right? Yeah. Here are 10 years of my life, and, I, and, and hear me now. I was never assigned a word of Karl Marx mm-hmm. in those three institutions in terms of his mature economic analysis. I'm not talking about the Communist Manifesto. That's a political document mm-hmm. written in the heat of a revolutionary time. Sure, I mean, it's worth reading, but mm-hmm. that's not where you go uh, to get the, the, the core analytics of, of a person. So I feel kind of ripped off by American education that they were so frightened by the Cold War when I was a student that they almost took pride in not having anything to do with Marxism, socialism, communism, any of that stuff. It was all disloyal somehow. It was all scary. And so we as students were protected. I like to use the analogy. It's like if you protect your children from learning about sex, you're not doing them any favor at all because they're going to discover it later right. and where right. you could have helped them mm-hmm. have a healthy attitude about it. Sure. Now it's going to be, and that's a little bit, a little bit of the edge you sometimes pick up from people like me because we had to learn it on our own. We had to go and find the books and all the rest. We could do that. They were in the library. Right. The censorship wasn't a hundred percent, but you know, the professor, if you asked a question about Marx, the professor looked at you as if you had forgotten to wear your pants that day. You know, you, you were odd. <laughs> but but not in not in a modern university today. Some on the right would argue <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, like, you know, just a footnote on that. Yeah. I am occasionally confronted by that. And, and it's one of those moments where you say to yourself, do we live in different planets? Yeah. I mean, I re- I've been a professor all my life in half a dozen American universities. I've given lectures at at least 50 universities in my life. Uh, the notion that Marxists have any kind of significant presence in American higher education, I mean, that's nuts. That's not the case. They were weeded out, if there were very many, and I don't think there ever were, but if there were a bunch, the Cold War did a number on them. Yeah. What okay. you do have is you have a lot of liberals. Right. But you got to be careful. A yeah. liberal and a Marxist are not the same thing. Yeah, well, tell us about that. But then I got to fire some questions at you. But tell us, explain yeah. that one. That's that's worth worth it. Uh, a liberal and a Marxist, Marxist are not the same thing. Um, when you say that, what do you mean? What I mean is that a liberal is part of the consensus of support for capitalism. Mm -hmm. Liberals and conservatives, in my judgment, are both, like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, celebrants of capitalism. They have some disagreements about how you best support and help and endorse capitalism. The conservative tends to believe, a la laissez-faire, that the government should keep a minimum position, a minimum role, interfere as little as possible, either not at all if you take it to libertarianism, or minimally uh, maintain the currency and courts and police yeah. and, and military, yeah. but that's it. The In- liberal, infrastructure, yeah. Right. The liberal says, no, 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 you leave capitalism to its own devices. It produces uh, business cycle collapses. It produces inequality. You've got to regulate it and, and redistribute right. it a little bit. Yeah. And yeah. you have to control it. You have to limit it. The only agency capable of doing that is the government. And so the proper support for capitalism is to have a judicious, targeted interference by the government um, in an ongoing way in these sixth manner and, and okay. in a periodic so, way. So if we've got that spectrum from libertarian to conservative to liberal, then what's a Marxist? Complete redistribution? No, no, no. no. Not okay. at all. That's okay. a liberal. Okay. That's a, li- a okay. liberal. Okay. Workers of the world unite? What? <laughs> you know, where, where, no. where do we put Das Kapital in here? <laughs> okay. Um, preface. Capital is a very rich piece of work. Yeah, it is. I, and it is interpreted Incredible. in different ways by different writers, huh? just like Adam Smith, just like the Bible, sure. just like any just like major, anything, just like Ayn Rand. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to answer the question the way I understand okay. it. Sure. But I'm not claiming that everybody 
who calls themselves a Marxist would agree. Okay. So for me, the, the critique that Marx offers, particularly in volume one of Capital, but in other places too, is a critique that says the root of the problem, uh, why you have an unequal distribution of income, why you have instability, business cycles, and all of that, uh, has to do with the organization of the workplace, the enterprise. We, in capitalism, organize it in a fundamental way with which Marx disagrees. And the reorganization, the changing of that organization, is the root problem which, if it isn't solved, renders all the efforts to solve capitalism's other problems unsuccessful. So Marx would argue, for example, that the reason we are worried about poverty today in capitalism is the same as the reason that we 20 years ago worried about poverty and 40 years ago worried about poverty, that as long as we've had capitalism, the gap between rich and poor has animated an immense array of social criticism. Ditto our business cycles. Everything we've tried to do to deal with those problems has failed. Why? Why has it failed? Why are we now, as I speak with you, experiencing one of the worst collapses of capitalism in its history? And why have we had three well, of them in this new century? I've got a question to illuminate that. That's my next question area, but finish up with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So Mar Marx's answer, long story short, as usual, given the constraints of time. Marx's answer is capitalism didn't make the break from feudalism and slavery that it thought it did. That break still has to be made, and Marx is the analyst who explains to us what it is. And here's the summary. Okay. In slavery, you divided the people involved in production into two groups, master, slave. The master had all the power, literally owned the slave, controlled the situation, amassed great wealth. Yep. In feudalism, you divided people, in, again, in the production of goods and services into two groups, lord and serf, mm -hmm. same story. Yep. Capitalism criticized those systems, criticized them for their inequality, for all that, and it promised to break from that. That's what the French Revolution and American Revolution slogans were about. Yep. But it failed. And the reason it failed is it replicated the split. Only now it wasn't lord and serf or master and slave. It was employer yeah. and employee. Yeah. It's, it's labor and, and capital, Marx basically. That's yeah. right. That's right. And the solution, the Marxist critique of that goes right there and says you could organize the economic life of a society, meaning the micro level of the enterprise in a radically different way, a democratic way, because capitalism is not democratic. It, the, the owner does not consult the workers as to what it is he's going to do. The board of directors doesn't either. But you but, could have an alternative. Wait a minute. Let me okay. just finish. Right. You could have an alternative in which it was run as a worker co-op. Sure. In other words, yeah. everybody has one vote yep. and you decide collectively what you're going to produce, what technology you're going to use, uh, where you're going to do it, yeah. and what you're going to do with the profits collectively that all of you have helped to produce. Marx's argument is that turning the enterprise into a community, hence the word communism, is the way forward. has nothing to do with the state. Marx didn't write about the state, wasn't interested in the state. So when you asked at the beginning, about misunderstanding, yeah, people made some decisions that the way to get to a communism was by seizing the state, either with elections or with revolution. And then they got a little bit waylaid along the way. They got really entranced with the state, and you got this peculiar 19th and 20th century aberration, I would call it, in which they focused on how you get to, rather than what Marx said was the place you were going, and ended up stuck in the middle with a very powerful state, but they couldn't make, because they didn't understand how to do it, the right. transition, so they ended up with what we would call state capitalism, yeah. and not, not a transition.